In this video, I'm going to tell you the top three reasons that why you should start learning PyTorch and compare it with its top competitor, TensorFlow, and why, it, why being dynamic matters, and what it means that TensorFlow uses static computation. And to get a sense of coding in PyTorch, we efficiently load the fashion MNIST data. And then you'll die. <laughs> The third reason that I want to start with is performance. Unfortunately, there is no official benchmarking. And that means a lot of people around the world are experimenting with this framework independently. And the results are uh, not unique and sometimes are contrasting. That's because it depends on many things like the architecture of your neural network. Is it CNN or RNN? Your model of GPU and CPU and the version of TensorFlow and PyTorch you are doing the experiment with and performance at inference time or training time because it actually makes a lot of difference and maybe that's because the results are not completely matched. At the end of the day, a slower framework may be better for you because sometimes PyTorch is a lot faster than others but its CPU or GPU utilization is also higher. So it depends on your criteria. Is the inference the speed? the only limitation that you have to deal with. So I think a lot to wrap it up because it's so much complicated than saying PyTorch is 10 times faster always. And I come up with these numbers, 10, 20, and 70. 10% of the time, PyTorch is a bit slower. And 20% of the time, they are at the same level. And the other 70%, PyTorch is about 1.5 times faster. With this said, that's the end of reason 3. The second reason why you should learn PyTorch is dynamic graph computation. It's really easier to see and understand um, dynamic and aesthetic computation by comparing the way TensorFlow and PyTorch are working. Starting with TensorFlow 1, you have to build all of your architecture up front and you can't see what's see, uh, one step further from the input and you have to compile all of your graph first and then run it. Here is a piece of code in TensorFlow 1.14. I simply define A and B to be two variable tensor and then multiply them and store the result in C. By running the code you see something like this. As you can see the result is something that is called symbolic node. That means that the operation hasn't been done actually yet but TensorFlow has to do it when? When it compiled the whole graph. After TensorFlow 2 released last year, they enabled eager execution by default, which uh, calculate the operation without building a graph. And you can calculate gradient with something called a gradient tape. But it's not still the recommended way by TensorFlow, and it feels a little bit weird. But with PyTorch, the computational graph is built dynamically. What it means is that when you, s when you specify the relation between input and output, it starts to, and actually you have to set requires grad to true, it will start to save tensor values and derivative rule with respect to that a specific node that you've made. And here is the code in PyTorch. Here, when you run the code, you see easily is 50. <laughs> And that's the reason why it is really easy to use and understand. And dum -da -da -dum -da -da -dum, the most important reason that I think you should start learning PyTorch is because it feels Python. Because it feels like Python with some helper classes designed for deep learning. It's fully integrated with Python, especially when you're working with your dataset. You can literally do everything with NumPy and Panda. And that makes things super easy. As you may already know, the machine learning datasets are huge. So you cannot entirely load them into memory because your memory blew up. The rational way is to split your dataset into some batches, usually size of a power of two like A32 and 64, and then load each batches into your memory. That's easy to say, but is it easy to implement in? PyTorch. Let me show you a little example. 
For the sake of completeness, I included the download part of dataset. And now you're expected to have a file called index.csv and a folder name img. You can see what they look like. I don't want to get into details of dataset and data loader class, but here is an example you have to see that you have to implement underline underline get item and underline underline len, which we go through them one by one. And in it, I get and load the CSV file via Panda. In underline underline get item, I load that a specific index from the CSV file, uh, load the image and convert it to a NumPy array. And that's also true for the Y label. And then just I return the image and the label as a top. As a little of test here, I made an object of my class and passed the CSV file and then print the length of my dataset, which ends to calling underline underline len. And then I use the train loader which splits my dataset into batches of 64 because I passed the 64 to as a, para as a parameter and then returns me an iterator. And also in the loop, I print the length of X and Y and print the shape of first element of X, which is an image. And you can see that the length of dataset is 60,000 images and each batch is 64 images with Y labels has 64 labels for that images. That makes sense. And each image is 28 by 28. So everything uh, works fine here. So it was a kind of in-depth introduction to PyTorch. Here's the conclusion. If you're a researcher that doesn't care much about deployment like Android and stuff like that, and its diffuse and performance is a high priority for you, PyTorch at the moment is one of the best options for you. Please like and subscribe. See you next time.